For more on what's happening on the broader markets, joining us now is Thomas Dignan, head of America's Investment Solutions at UBS Asset Management. Thomas, thanks so much for your time today. Great to be here. So what do you make of, uh, you know, markets perhaps shifting focus now from the debt ceiling divide uh, and maybe more to the Fed? Do you see that sort of shift happening? There is a little bit of a shift, but I don't think it's dramatic because I think most people believed um, that there would be some resolution there. And I think it was something hanging over the market that we thought we would get through. It looks like we're through that. But I think you're right. The Fed um, impact is still there. And the Fed, I think, still has some work to do. What do you make of uh, all the excitement we've been seeing in the AI space? I was talking about a couple of things, but, uh, you know, there's been a lot of deals recently happening. Uh, uh, Microsoft reportedly uh, making a deal today with CoreWeave uh, for uh, cloud computing infrastructure um, uh, with uh, an AI component there. Um, there just seems to be so much going on and so much talk of it. Uh, how do you navigate the, the artificial intelligence uh, in investment landscape? Well, it'd be nice if I could ask Chat GPT what to do. And it would tell me, but unfortunately, they're not there yet. And and I will tell you, I think you used the right, right word. You need to navigate it. And you talked about enthusiasm. We almost need a, a word stronger than enthusiasm. The the good thing is we've we've seen this before. Think back to the tech bubble, and you go through phases. You go through the initial phase, which is you just buy the theme. People are so excited. It is a game changer in a lot of respects. And it is a boon in terms of demand for cloud computing and semiconductors, and um, there's so many beneficiaries from it. But then the next phase is separating the winners from the losers. And, and we're not there yet. If you think back like early tech days, you know, if you wanted to look something up, you went to Netscape. That was your browser. So <laughs> we don't know who the, they, they'll, they'll have to flush themselves out. But I think you'll have this period in the interim where companies do trade above intrinsic value. And that's a very difficult thing for investors to play because the weight of that uh, eventually, you know, weighs on the company. But it, while the theme is still in play, these, these companies can go up pretty dramatically. Right. I mean, so there's the potential that that um, that value could sort of um, normalize, you know, in the future after these huge gains that we've seen. I mean, we, we've looked at NVIDIA a lot uh, because it has had, um, you know, such a, a meteoric rise so far this year. But I mean, that kind of thing couldn't necessarily continue. Well, they've had a meteoric rise on two fronts on price but, but also on revenue. So this right. isn't just buying the dream. Um, that's a company that they are executing and they're seeing the benefits. But in terms of trying to extrapolate that and the growth assumption you have to have going forward, you've got a company you know, trading at 50 times next 12 months earnings. And that's, that's just, that's a difficult uh, hurdle to keep clearing. We've been talking a lot about retail as well, Thomas, and you're, you're underweight consumer discretionary. So would that retail be falling into that category, something that you wouldn't be um, interested in in this moment? Well, it, it would. And I think if you look at it, we're overweight uh, staples, mm -hmm. underweight discretionary. And that's really just within the U.S. The U.S. market now is starting to look attractive relative to Europe, as Europe has rallied even more than the U.S. this year. And... But if you want to play the U.S., we, we still think you want to play it a little bit defensively. And what about China? Because, um, you know, we focused a lot on China, especially at the start of the year, and what could potentially come of the reopening there. How do you see that progressing? Because when we were, you know, if we could rewind a couple of months, you know, there was an expectation that it might ha happen sort of with a bang, and then maybe it would take some time to kind of fully play out. What are, what are you thinking when you're thinking about China right now? Well, when you look at it, you have to contrast it to what we went through in the U.S. When you, when you go back to the U.S. from a COVID, first, we, we got more fiscal stimulus than China did. But, I, but China, the lockdown was so long, I think the anticipation was when they reopen, they're really going to reopen. Things are going to move. And what you've seen is the Chinese consumer has actually been very cautious. Um, the Chinese ec economy has not recovered in the way that people would have anticipated. And then one of the things you have to look at is – President Xi has much more flexibility than, you know, than the typical government. He can, he can turn on the spigot, but if you want to remember just from like the COVID situation, he can kind of withstand the pain longer than most people might anticipate. The one thing where it might really give him an impetus to, to really move the economy is when you look at the unemployment rate 
um, of like the 18 to 25 year old segment. It's, it's very high. Mm. And that is, if I'm a, a ruler, that's not a segment of the population that I want to be um, upsetting too much. So he, you know, uh, I, I think you'll see that he'll, he'll make some moves and it, it's really, you need to really be quick and measure the degree of the moves. Just to shift back to North America, what are you expecting in terms of, um, you know, uh, maybe a soft landing, a hard landing or a, a recession or, or what have you? Because it, it seems a bit, well, it has been divided for quite some time, but it, it, it seems like there are even more questions about how this is going to play out because we keep seeing resilience um, in a lot of uh, different elements, whether it's the job market, the economy as a whole, consumer spending. Um, however, Inflation still needs to get down to the target if you're you, uh, coming from the perspective of our, our central banks, whether it's the U.S. or Canada. So does that mean, you know, even if there is a pause by the Fed at the next meeting, that interest rates do have to get, go higher or that they have to stay there longer and that there's going to be more pain in order to bring inflation down? That's a very long-winded uh, uh, question. But, uh, you know, when you're thinking about the impact on uh, the economy in North America, what, what, what do you see on the horizon? Well, there, there's a lot in there, and, and we've been in the resilience camp. And I would say the next phase from resilience is looking at, like, okay, if there is a slowdown, we're looking at it as it's a very slow slowdown. This isn't falling down steeply. It's kind of the slope is very mod modestly lower. And I think that's good for the overall economy, but it also gives the Fed kind of room to be patient. But from the Fed's perspective, they don't want to get three-quarters of the way there. They, they have a job to do, and I think it will include um, another hike down the line, but they have, you know, the economy is not roaring right now. They can, they can pause, and they can just, you know, be very patient. Because right now, um, the resilience of the economy is giving them the means to be patient, but we are seeing some positive signs on cost input pressures where inflation is moderating a little bit.